Why is John Carpenter's Halloween still considered the fundamental slasher movie? Is it simply because it was the first? There are films released before that are considered part of the genre. However, it was Halloween that really crystallized the slasher template and inspired a slew of imitators. The film, a super low budget independent, was a box office smash. So producers, seeing how much money could be made from such low concept horror movies, went looking through their calendars for other events that could be exploited. Yet Halloween is still the most iconic. It's also arguably the most simple and that's one of the things I admire about the film, the economy. The core of the movie's action takes place over the course of one day. We begin in this peaceful, everyday suburbia. Like Alfred Hitchcock earlier in Shadow of a Doubt, and later David Lynch in Blue Velvet, Carpenter is using a location that is supposed to be safe and secure. Once night falls, we're mostly confined to two houses that are across the street from each other. Besides the opening prologue, and a dog. The first on-screen murder does not happen until over 50 minutes into what is only a 90 minute film. It's a whole 40 minutes prior when Michael Myers first appears and starts stalking the characters and close to 20 minutes before Myers draws his attention on Annie. Annie is painted as somewhat obnoxious and insensitive, frequently teasing Laurie, the character that has been built up for the audience to identify with most. He was standing right there. Poor Laurie. Scared another one away. Because of the way she's been set up, I think it's safe to assume the audience highly suspects this character will be killed. Yet Carpenter patiently stretches this sequence for as long as he can sustain it. Michael Myers watches Annie as she undresses. Like Norman Bates, who we looked at in the previous Psycho episode, Myers has a murderous impulse that appears to be linked to sexual arousal. And of course, much has been said about the way sex and nudity in a horror film is an offence that is punishable by death. Big no no! Sex equals death, okay? However, nudity also makes a character appear vulnerable. As Annie leaves the house to do washing, the tension increases because the character becomes more isolated. Due to the fairly wide composition here, Carpenter is able to create areas of danger within the frame. In a previous scene where Tommy, the child Laurie is babysitting, is scared, Laurie says she will protect him. The boogeyman can only come out on Halloween night, right? Right. While I'm here tonight, I'm not about to let anything happen to you. Promise? Promise. However, in the context of the movie, the roles are actually reversed. The audience will think it's unlikely a child will be murdered, therefore children are safe havens for both the characters and the audience. In this dense image that uses frames within frames, you can notice Myers in the background, and Carpenter has the actor move his head so that we register him. Throughout the whole film, Carpenter is restrained and strategic in the way he utilizes Myers. He's careful not to reveal his face too upfront, or when the shot is head on, it's from a distance. And as the film goes on, we get incrementally closer. And I often find ways to obscure him, such as this ghost-like image, where he seems almost superimposed. Surprisingly, except in the famous opening sequence, Myers has no stalking point of view shots, a technique that ended up being used excessively in later slashes, often feeling uninspired. And in the first Halloween sequel, Carpenter's formal rigor is noticeably absent. Like in this shot, where a steady cam just follows Myers from behind. The shot goes on for too long, and his physicality feels different. He's too tangible, there's no mystery. Or look at the first murder sequence, where just a minute after choosing his first victim, we get this. Back to Annie. Even though Myers has been stalking her for 18 minutes, Carpenter sustains the sequence even further. Going through a whole scenario where Annie can't open the car and has to go back into the house. only to return moments later. This composition, like many in the film, is engulfed in darkness. And notice how Carpenter has restrained himself from using any music to increase the impact of this. Ah! 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 
Like the sequence, the attack itself is sustained. The location is the most claustrophobic we've seen. And this is the closest head-on view of Myers we've had, but he's still obscured by the window. Comparatively, the next couple of murders happen in quick succession. I think this is because after the first kill is out of the way, the audience would not sustain the same interest in characters they have built little sympathy for. Another element Carpenter likes to sustain is the duration of his shots. Sometimes it will be for purely economical purposes, like in many of the scenes that involve Dr. Loomis, who's mostly used as an expositional character, providing background information that gives more weight to Michael Myers. I watched him for 15 years, sitting in a room, staring at a wall, not seeing the wall, looking past the wall, looking at this night. Because a lot of these scenes are essentially breaks from the more intense core narrative, it's fine to have them just roll out in one long take. But he will also sustain a shot to heighten the intensity. We know that Myers could appear from nowhere. He could be hiding in any corner or shadow. So the audience is not given the relief of a cut. On top of this, he orchestrates effects within the shot, like here with the door creaking. The camera moves with him, pushing in closer to the danger zone. And from here on out, the position is held. Once again, there's a palpable feeling of claustrophobia, and the space becomes even more terrifying as Maya's trademark breathing appears on the soundtrack, which gets louder and louder as the character moves closer to his death. Surprisingly, the film is mostly absent of blood and gore. In the trio of murders, there's literally none. Subsequent slashes weren't so restrained, both in the amount of blood on screen and the overall body count. Gore is gross, but it's not necessarily scary. The mind can conjure up infinitely more disturbing imagery. Plus there's a schism in the audience where they are frightened of the oncoming violence whilst also having a bloodlust. And as the genre progressed, it became more about the outlandishness of the death scene. Audiences started to cheer on the killer because they weren't really invested in the characters. Halloween avoids this because the central characterization is strong. Carpenter took the time earlier in the film to build a three-dimensional character that is relatable to the audience. Laurie seems to be stuck in a sort of limbo between childhood and adulthood. She's not as outgoing as her friends and she represses her sexuality, even though she clearly does pine for the opposite sex. Ben Tramer. I knew it! <laughs> See, you do think about things like that, huh, Lori? <laughs> Tellingly, this scene is shot at dusk, as she's on the cusp of transitioning to the more adult, nighttime terrain. After the couple is dispatched, we focus back on Lori for what will be the final passage of the film. The stakes for the audience are now higher. As she leaves the house, we get the Hitchcockian point of view reaction sequence of shots. Hitchcock says that the magic of film editing is the ability to play with time. Here Carpenter does exactly that, drawing out Laurie's walk across the street for as long as possible, playing on the fact that the audience knows she's heading into danger. Then Laurie moves across the frame and we cut to this objective angle. She's crossed over the line. She's about to become the next potential victim as she gradually gets further and further away from us. Once inside, she's forced to confront the evil that's present in the world. Like sexuality, acknowledging death is part of her adult realization. Again, Carpenter plays with dark, empty spaces, first quickly to shock, and then slowly to produce pure terror. You could make a reading of the film where Myers is a symbolic manifestation of Laurie's inner turmoil. Throughout the day, he often appears through her point of view, as if it were a daydream. And Myers frequently seems to drift in and out of the film's reality. I just talked with Ben Tramer and he got real excited when I told him how attracted you were to him. When Annie brings up Laurie's crush, it unleashes this controlled, deliberate camera move where a child for the first time sees this. Can't tell you anything. Every time I tell you something. 
Again, a confrontation with Myers peaks in a claustrophobic space. Yet Laurie won't just sit back and let Myers kill her. She will use that pent up, repressed energy and strike back. And the audience will cheer her on as though it's a form of catharsis. Michael Myers is an almost mythic creature. Carpenter wanted to create a villain that was somewhere in between a superhuman monster and a more real life psychopath. It became somewhat of a trend in later slasher films for the villain to have a backstory that gives a rationalization for the violent acts. Whereas of Myers, no such explanation is given. We don't know what made him commit that first murder as a child or why he still has these murderous impulses. And it's this unknown evil that makes it all the more terrifying. In the final shots, we go back to all the locations that his ghost-like presence inhabited. And once again, the sound of his breathing starts to engulf the soundtrack. This seemingly inoffensive suburban landscape is haunted by his presence. And we end on the once everyday house that now appears as sinister as any other haunted house because of the evil it birthed there. <laughs>